Welcome, and thank you all for joining the Built Environment and Healthy Spaces webinar. I hope you are all staying safe during these extraordinary times. Today, we will explore opportunities to integrate and promote health and well being into product and building design using real world examples from three building product manufacturers, including the design and material innovations shaping future healthy spaces under the Cradle to Cradle certified framework. Let's meet today's presenters and panelists. My name is Bergen Hubert, and I'm based out of Washington, DC. And I'm the manager of the built environment at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. I work with product manufacturers and various members of the built environment community, including owners and developers, architects and designers, and partnering organizations to try to increase the number of C2C certified products and more broadly, safe and circular materials in the market. I'm going to let everyone else introduce themselves. I'm going to pass it to Kelly. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Ballou, and I am Director of Sustainability at Shaw Industries. And I have a dedicated focus on the commercial side of our business, or better known as the built environment. I manage our technical product stewardship team that obtains all of our product certifications that are relevant in the marketplace, including all of our cradle to cradle work. I also work closely with commercial sales and marketing teams to share Shaw's sustainability strategy and our efforts with our clients. Great, thanks Kelly. And Kendra? Hi everybody, thank you for joining us today. I'm Kendra Martz. I'm Construction Specialties Manager of Sustainable New Product Development. Um, so I sort of wear two hats at my company. Um, I'm based out of our New Jersey office. The first hat most obviously is the sustainability side. Um, so I, like Kelly, oversee our um, sustainability strategy, manage our product certifications, work with the Cradle to Cradle team on getting those product certifications along with others. And then the other part of it that suits um, and pairs up really well is I help run the project management side of all of our new product development initiatives within our company, which ultimately means I can help build in sustainability into our product design side. Great, thanks Kendra. And last but not least, Rachel. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Berman. I am the Sustainability Program Manager uh, for MECO. We are window shade manufacturers. Um, similar to my co-presenters, I manage all of our sustainability certifications including cradle to cradle certification, working with our supply team and uh, in our supply chain and ensuring that all of our materials and ingredients comply with all of our requirements and help us maintain our cradle to cradle certifications. I sit in the marketing team. So this enables me to also help train both our internal um, sales members and our internal colleagues, as well as clients such as yourself. Thank you, Rachel. Great. I want to begin by setting the stage for our conversation today around healthy spaces, the built environment, and the role we all play in it. This crisis has reminded every individual and organization of the need for coordinated action for addressing immediate global challenges in public health. As the topics of preparedness and risk management rise to the top of pretty much every organization's agenda, there's an unprecedented opportunity to ensure that health, resiliency, and sustainability become embedded in plans for future development. As we look forward, the companies who maintain and hone their focus on environmental and social well being are well positioned for the strongest post pandemic recovery. By using this time to reset approaches to design, production, and consumption in ways that prioritize humans and the environment we can transform the global pipeline of materials and products that power our economy into one that is safe, circular, and responsible. We can collectively prioritize our efforts to create and maintain spaces that are healthy and have a positive impact, not only on inhabitants in the environment, but, at, but for the economy at large. Unfortunately, most of the products that power our economy and make up our workplaces and homes today are not designed using safe materials or for recycling or reuse. This causes us to consume rapidly, diminish materials and resources at an alarming rate, and continue to pollute our bodies and the environment. 
the concept of a circular economy represents a significant change in the way we make and use resources, materials, and finished products. A circular economy is an alternative to the traditional take, make, waste, or linear economy in which we keep resources in use for as long as possible, extract the maximum value from them while they're in use, and then recover and regenerate product and materials at the end of each service life, instead of allowing them to become yet more waste. This approach allows for significant returns on the triple bottom line. This includes economic, environmental, and social benefits like better natural resource stewardship, cost savings through efficiencies, and significantly less material waste and health impacts on humans and our environment. But before any of this can happen, we have to take the first step, and that is to create safe and healthy materials to power the circular economy. In order to create a healthy and sustainable product or space, whether that's a home, an office, a hotel, a hospital, or our entire built environment, we need to ensure that chemicals and materials used in the products are selected to prioritize the protection of human health and the environment and generate a positive impact on the quality of materials available for future use and cycling. So how do we do this? How do we create healthy spaces using safe and circular building materials? Material health is a critical building block in cradle to cradle design. To help companies ensure the material health of their products, the cradle to cradle certified material health methodology helps companies identify and begin the process of finding safe substitutions for chemicals of concern, moving products through a continuous improvement process until products at the highest level of achievement contain no known toxins or potentially toxic ingredients and are comprised of completely green chemistry. We assess the health of a material in a four-step pathway. First, we consider what's in the product through a process of inventorying or making a list of ingredients. Not all inventories are the same. Cradle to Cradle Certified comprehensively inventories chemical information of each material within a product down to 100 parts per million. Then we determine what's not in the product. This is done by screening against list of known problematic chemicals. There are hundreds of different screening lists out there but our version four restricted substances list is harmonized with REACH and other leading chemical regulations. So this screening is helpful to rule out certain bad chemicals or classes of chemicals, but it will not tell you whether what is in the product is compatible with human and environmental health. Next, a comprehensive assessment is conducted by chemists and toxicologists to evaluate chemical hazard profiles and their potential risk in specific specific product context. Our assessment looks at 21 human health and environmental endpoints. This includes endocrine disruption, carcinogenicity, reproductive and developmental toxicity, climate relevance, and environmental persistence and bioaccumulation. And finally, we ask the question, how can it be safer by redesigning, reformulating, and innovating to pose no risks? When a product is fully assessed for compatibility with human and environmental health, the process of identifying and phasing out chemicals of concern or replacing them with safer alternatives for a fully optimized product and supply chain becomes possible. This concept is realized through the work done by the participating companies you'll hear from today. At the Institute, we work towards our vision by administering what is called the Cradle to Cradle Products Certified Products Program, which guides designers and manufacturers through an assessment based on five categories of sustainability. Material health, which you just heard about, is to ensure products are intel intentionally designed, um, inventoried and assessed, and then optimized for human and environmental health and safety. Product circularity is to ensure that products are designed for their next use and are actively being cycled. Renewable energy and climate is to ensure product manufacturing results in positive impact on the renewable energy supply and the balance of climate changing greenhouse gases. Water stewardship is to ensure water is treated as a precious and shared resource, watersheds are protected, and clean water is available to people and all other organisms. 
And finally, social fairness is to ensure manufacturers are committed to upholding human rights and applying responsible business practices to all stakeholders. Today, you will hear from three material health pioneers in building product manufacturing and how they are demonstrating their positive impact for a safe and circular future through their use of this cradle to cradle certified framework for over 10 years. And with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Rachel Berman of MECO. Great, thank you so much, Bargain. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day today. And I uh, am grateful for the opportunity to share our cradle to cradle journey with you. So for those of you who aren't aware, MECO is a window shade manufacturer. We create manual, motorized, and automated shading systems. So we are a provider for both the textile of the shade and also the hardware system. So we'll be talking about both of these um, components when it comes to cradle to cradle certification. But before we dive into the Rachel, we might have lost you there. Let's see if we can get her back. Looks like she's dialing back in. I'll take this opportunity to say if you guys have any questions, go ahead and um, put them in the Q&A box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. And I think maybe in the interest of time, maybe we can skip ahead to our next presenter. Yeah, we'll wait for her to come back. Now let me go ahead and advance to Kelly, who will be our next presenter. There's Rachel. Rachel oh, came back. Great. Hey, Rachel. Oh, uh -oh. Rachel, you're on mute, though. I'm so sorry about that. My internet disappeared. Are we still going? Yeah, yeah. Let's um, let's put you back on. Um, we were going to advance ahead, but we'll go back to your desk. Okay. Great. So sorry about that, everyone. All right. Okay. Awesome. So where was I? Before we get into the product, um, before we get into the product, sorry, I'm telling everyone in my family to get off the internet right now because there's many users and I'm assuming that's why. Um, so before we get into the product, I would love to kick this off just by understanding the overall um, state of where we are today in terms of what is the impact of materials on our health. MECO started getting involved with Cradle to Cradle back in the 90s with the emergence of sick building syndrome. Um, and that's when we were first starting to become aware that buildings impact our health. Now today that has grown to the study of the exposome, our exposures. The CDC created um, a study called the Human Genome Project. And the idea was understanding the human genome to eradicate um, disease risk associated with um, hereditary conditions and by understanding our genome. 
However, what they found is that only 10% of our health condition was actually impacted from, from our human genome, and the rest is from our exposures. And that, of course, includes our built environment. And so many of these medical institutions are creating centers for exposomic research that are not just focusing on, um, they're focusing our exposures and understanding, for example, the impact of flame retardants and phthalates and how is that making us sick? Because as I'm sure um, many of you are, are aware, um, Bergen, you need to resend the, the slide. There we go, perfect. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we have become indoor creatures. We spend over 90% of our time indoors. And this picture right here may as well be my son. He plays in ball pits and I live in New York City and children in daycares in New York City typically don't have access to even natural light in windows for safety precautions. So we've really become indoor creatures and the indoor environment has a huge impact on our health. So many of the leading um, building standards in the United States uh, have as a result taken it upon themselves to make sure that products in those buildings are also healthy. And cradle to cradle is a methodology and way to achieve these different material health requirements. And the reason that they're using cradle to cradle to achieve optimal material health is because they want to avoid greenwashing. Now, greenwashing is when people make a sustainability or health claim without having data to back it up. So other industries have fallen victim to this, especially the food industry. There's a lot of words that can describe this basket of fruit. Natural is one of them. But what does natural actually mean? Natural has no metric. And that's the value of cradle to cradle. It gives a metric to what we are looking at. So when we come back to Mecca, we'll be looking at our circularity for textiles, design for disassembly strategies of our mechanical systems, and also how we design for flexibility and upgrade. So when it comes to textiles, the traditional shade cloth that was used prior to the 90s, I would say, or early 2000s, was vinyl coated polyester. Um, this is a polyester core with a vinyl jacket. And again, as I mentioned earlier, MECO, um, you know, really became aware of sick building syndrome and some of the health implications with vinyl. And so what we wanted to do was come up with a material that had optimal material health, was circular, and also had similar performance attributes to um, a vinyl coated polyester. And the way we did that was collaborate with MBDC, who was Bill McDonough's toxicology group, and also our supplier. And what we did was come up with a material that has a similar look and aesthetic and performance to vinyl coated polyester, but is PVC free. So if you look on the left, that is our vinyl coated polyester material. You can see there's a polyester core with a vinyl jacket extruded around it. And on the right is our TPO material, which we launched in 2004 called EcoVail, that has a thermoplastic olefin core and jacket. So it has a similar look and aesthetic, but it's also 100% circular because it can be recycled since it's comprised of the same polymer. Um, and that was the first cradle, to cradle, first cradle to Cradle certified shade cloth. And it was designed with cradle to cradle principles in its entirety. So even though it's a great material, from a material health perspective, it's not perfect. And why is that? That is because of flame retardants. Window shades in the United States have to comply with a shade code called NFPA 701. It's a really strict flame test. And as a result, we're forced to add halogenated flame retardants to the material. Um, and halogenated flame retardants have serious health implications. Um, what happens with flame retardants is they typically flake off and then they turn into dust and then that dust gets ingested by our most vulnerable populations. And typically in shade cloths, the flame retardant is encapsulated within the core material. Um, but again, cradle to cradle incentivizes optimization. And so for over 10 years, we tried to optimize the EcoVail material with a less toxic flame retardant, but we were not successful. 
And as a result, we took our optimization pathway and went in a different direction and started working with a different material. And that was polyester. Polyester is inherently flame resistant. So we were able to find a methodology of creating a polyester that actually doesn't require any chemical flame retardants. And as a result, we were able to optimize that chemical completely out of the supply chain. So it has, that product is called Ecovail Shear. It's 100% polyester. It is also HHI compliant. It's the only one, only shade cloth that meets this rigorous, um, this rigorous requirement. Um, it's circular, it's 100% recyclable, and it's made with bi-component yarns. So it also has the aesthetic and performance of a standard textile shade cloth. And that you can see all the way on the right. Um, and we're extremely proud of it. And that was launched in 2017. So here is a, you can really see our optimization journey of almost 20 years. And for Mecco, it's a constant um, way to challenge ourselves and to make sure that we are doing the best we can with the materials that we can provide for our clients. So we talked about textiles, but when we really think about a shade, um, something needs to make it go up and down. There's a whole system behind it um, that often gets left behind, but we want to make sure that everyone is thinking about shades as a system and not just a textile. So we have our manual shade systems and our motorized shade systems. So our manual shade systems have actually been um, cradle to cradle certified since 2012. So all of the manual shades going out have all have a cradle to cradle certification. And then our motorized shades, which we're really excited to be talking about today, we're in the process of undergoing the cradle to cradle version four beta test, um, beta standard certification. So we're trying it out right now and we'll hopefully in the panel discussion have a couple lessons learned that um, we're excited to share with everyone. So when we're working with complex assemblies, um, you wanna ensure that you're designing for disassembly, right? We want circular products. A textile is easy, it's one homogeneous material. But when you have complex assemblies, you have multiple homogeneous materials that you need to put together into a system that's durable and lasts. So a couple tips that we use is we always try to use mechanical fasteners. As you can see this portion right here um, on, the sh on top of the shade cloth, it's almost like a zip, like a, like a zip tie or a zip a press and seal. Um, and what it is, that material is made also out of thermoplastic olefin for our EcoVail shade cloths and it presses into the tube. So rather than using tape or an adhesive, we're able to manically adhere it to the tube itself, press it in, and then when we need to recycle it, we can recycle the spline, we call this a spline, with the shade cloth all together. And additionally, when we have multiple homogeneous ingredients, you need to make sure that you're not um, chemically adhering them and that you're screwing them or mechanically putting them together so that they can then be mechanically separated when you need to disassemble them. And then designing for flexibility and upgrades. So products should also help buildings achieve their own circularity goals. This product that we have is called Electro Pocket and its purpose is actually to help ease um, installation um, when you have to do a retrofit or if you need to service the shade, or even if you need to upgrade it. Typically, when you need to access a shade, you need to rip out ceiling tiles, which is a, a lot of time, money, and effort. But when you, we put in this pocket, you can actually pre-wire it, and you're able to then access the shade and through the ceiling without having to waste material or extra money. So it makes um, servicing and flexibility and upgrading a lot easier. So just in the general market of circularity, you know, the expectation right now is that a manufacturer is able to have a fully serviced take back system, which we're all trying, but it's not working for a lot of people. And so what I would always love to leave everybody with is how can we start integrating circularity principles into what we do every day? You know, the reality of how a product gets specified you know, it gets specified, a GC purchases it, it gets installed, you know, hopefully. And then there's multiple tenants in a space. How can an owner, once they're ready to final, 
finally get rid of the shades because shades typically stay in a pot in a space for a very long time. How do they know where to get sent back to? What do they actually have in their space? They need almost like a nutrition label for it or an, a manual. Um, so what we're seeing is that the responsibility can't be just on the manufacturer. We need to, we need to incorporate everybody in the value chain, GC, specifier, building owner. And I think C2C version four is really a tool that will help us get here. So in conclusion, Cradle to Cradle has impacted every aspect of our business and is more than a certification to us, but it's also a design methodology. And Ecovale and Ecovale Shear, which I talked about today, are created specifically for sustainability. But for example, in our other section of just our standard shade cloth, Acoustavale and Chelsea also have material health certificates. And then all of, we're aiming to have all of our hardware systems to have cradle to cradle certification. So, and even for products that happen, that do have to have PVC, we are working on health product declarations and we've also done um, other assessments on it as well. So we are really trying to bring cradle to cradle into all aspects of our business. So thank you very much. And I apologize for the technical glitch earlier um, and appreciate your patience. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, and thanks for uh, handling that like a champ. Um, if you have any questions for Rachel, uh, please save them or enter them into the question box and we can try to address them at the end. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Kelly Ballou of Shaw. So thank you so much, Bergen, and thank you, Rachel, uh, for that tremendous presentation. I'd love to start out also by sharing just a little bit about Shaw Industries. So Shaw Industries has grown globally from our founding in North Georgia more than half a century ago. Uh, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway and we, ha we have grown and built on our legacy in carpet to include floor coverings for every possible place and space and generation, generations of Shaw Associates, now 22,000 worldwide, have invented and innovated and designed flooring products for evolving preferences and needs. And you heard this statistic uh, from Rachel already, and it's a quite alarming one that now people are spending that whopping 90% of our time indoors. And this actually doesn't even include the time we spend in our vehicles commuting. So that's uh, quite alarming to me. And whether that's in our homes or at school or at work or restaurants or retail stores, hospitals, sports venues, all that time indoors really does increase your consciousness of the products you surround yourself with and are frankly, as, as Rachel said, exposed to. It's really no wonder why all these spaces where we learn and create and come together to solve life's biggest challenges have a significant impact on our well being. And now that we have become this indoor species, it's even more unfortunately evidenced in the last few months when we have spent quite a lot of time indoors, unfortunately. But instead of focusing on that, how can we turn this into a positive and an opportunity to create a nurturing new habitat in those spaces, whether that's from your role as a design professional or our role as a product manufacturer, we all have a tremendous key role in the products that finish out that interior, um, interior of a space. So this notion is why we at Shaw are so keenly focused on the ingredients that do go into our flooring products. Not only that, the impacts of sound and moisture and other design elements and their impact on people. And so what human impact expectations do we have for products used in all these spaces? And, and maybe said another way, how do you as the product selector know that a product has been designed with human impact considerations in mind. Let's break down that into some of the elements that actually go into human experience. Number one for sure is material health. We want to understand the ingredients that go into products and what kind of impacts these ingredients have on the well-being of people. And cradle to cradle product certification 
helps us truly understand the material health of all of our ingredients, like Bergen said, down to 100 parts per million per material. Other factors like acoustics encompass things like how loud your office is and how productive can employees be in a space when distracted by noise. And through acoustics, we, we explore the impact on your stress level in a multifamily housing unit um, without those acoustical considerations in either the construction material or those interior finishes. And surprisingly, this accounts for a significant portion of tenant turnover. Indoor air quality, we all know how much of a role that plays. Um, it can in fact help lower absenteeism in the workplace and encourage higher presenteeism from occupants in a space. And then there's design and what a huge box this is. Um, we are starting to design space that affects the mental and physical health and well-being of people. In fact, interiors can promote different types of activities. Do we intentionally plan the color? for emotional impact on mood and energy levels and attention spans? Or do we design mixed materials and textures for warmth, comfort, inspiration, or healing? And we all know that biophilic design uh, would play a huge role of bringing nature's indoors now that we aren't spending all that time outside. And then finally, and very relevantly, is cleanability, which is possibly the most talked about topic today thanks to to COVID-19's impact, yet historically it's probably been one of the most ignored topics. We need to look at both how we design and specify products to plan to keep them clean. And all of these considerations are these key aspects of uh, human experience with a space. At the same time, while you're immediately and primarily focused on the impact of product on people, we still cannot lose sight of those global challenges that require our attention as well. Whether that's broad global topics like climate change and big ocean plastics um, issues, that is so much bigger than one company alone can solve, but it is definitely going to take significant co collaboration to change our collective behavior and trajectory. As a company, we have to focus our resources and priorities. And so Shaw's sustainability efforts are focused on people and the planet, understanding how much of an impact our products have on the spaces and places of everyday life. Unfortunately, there is no one size fits all solution, even though all of our jobs would be easier if there was. Um, you truly cannot be sustainable if you only focus on one issue, like climate change, for example, you have to focus on all sides to solve the challenges that we share. There are multiple interdependent aspects of sustainability. And for Shaw, the cradle to cradle product certification and the cradle to cradle design philosophy is how we keep those myriad aspects in balance. And those are those aspects like Bergen described, material health, product circularity, um, water stewardship, renewable energy and climate, or social fairness. So picture those as the sides of the cube. And so for Shaw, Cradle to Cradle is just so much more than a product certification. Shaw has been involved with the Cradle to Cradle uh, philosophy and in collaboration since long before it was actually a product certification. It was a design philosophy first and foremost. And for Shaw, it's, it's a commitment. It's a commitment we made more than 20 years ago with the introduction of the very first cradle to cradle certified flooring product, our EcoWorks backed carpet tile. And as an enterprise, Shaw has the most certified platforms of anyone in the flooring industry. So I'd like to go a little deeper into some of those product um, innovation examples. How about EcoWorks carpet tile? We've now celebrated 20 years on the floor with more than 4 billion square feet of this product installed globally. And what makes us so proud of this product platform is that it does represent a beautiful example of intentional cradle to cradle design and marketplace choice. At the time we launched this, um, we had a PVC backed carpet tile. The marketplace had PVC backed carpet tiles. We introduced this non-PVC innovation 
and we allowed the marketplace to choose and they did so. And so we can really uh, refer to this as a circular economy solution as well because that was a design promise behind EcoWorks as well. Um, and so it has its take back program, Rachel, that you describe with all the challenges of the reverse logistics of getting that material home so that we can reuse it back into future generations of EcoWorks. Um, but I do want to pause a second and say that material health plays such a huge role in circularity and designing for circularity um, because you do want to make sure that the ingredients that you've selected are safe and designed to be circulated so that you wanna keep good things in the economy, not just recirculate bad things. On the residential side of our business, uh, we talk about a product innovation that makes use of a common consumer good like waste, uh, clear polyester water bottles like here, that we can turn into white dyeable carpet fiber in our polyester residential products. And then commercially, with the lower valued color uh, PET soda bottles, we can make a cushioned carpet backing like our Ecologix product. Here we can take the green soda bottles like Sprite or Mountain Dew and extrude it into fiber, needle it into a pad and put it into a uh, attached pad on the back of that product there, which provides you comfort under hood, underfoot and some enhanced acoustic performance. And so many of you know that the carpet industry has been on a sustainability journey for some time, but hard surface product applications and design aesthetics have resulted in amazing growth and transformation of the market. Uh, that res resilient category, both residentially and commercially, has revolutionized and changed our industry. Uh, challenging us to address what is currently PVC dominated uh, product chemistry um, to commercialize products that are that are alternatives to that. And I'm pleased to say that Shaw does have non PVC resilient alternatives that have been commercialized and cradle to cradle certified. And we continue to work towards the launch of a, a PET resilient rigid product that uses high post consumer recycled bottle flake to create an innovative innovative synthetic flooring. This product can consume waste polyester but hopefully one day can consume ocean plastics as well. This product is made from extruded PET fiber that is needled uh, into a pad and then pressed into a rigid board. The image layer of this product is digitally printed onto PET film, polyester film. Again, back to Rachel's comment about keeping that um, homogeneous material throughout. This one's polyester throughout. And then you don't have to have that sacrificial wear layer over your image layer. So it can perform in those rigorous commercial applications. This resilient product is also designed with a take back program for reclamation at no cost to the customer. Another example of cradle to cradle intentional design. As I wrap up my time, I wanna proudly say that almost 90% of the products Shaw manufacturers are cradle to cradle certified. It's not our one green thing, but instead it represents a significant portion of our product portfolio and our commitment to sustainability. And so thank you so much for, for my time today and I will be part of the questions later on. Back to you, Bergen. Great, thank you, Kelly. And um, in the interest of time, we will um, send it over to our last speaker today, certainly not least, Kendra Martz of Construction Specialties. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me today and I'm so honored to be on here with you and connect with you all today um, and share a little bit about Construction Specialties um, Cradle to Cradle journey. So just a little bit uh, about Construction Specialties um, for those who don't know us. Um, construction Specialties is a specialty building product manufacturer. We provide solutions to challenges that the design community faces every day. Um, and this includes products like protective acrobin wall covering to extruded louvers that allow buildings to breathe. Um, oh, there it goes. And as a specialty building product manufacturer, we have um, a diverse group of product lines. And with a diverse group of product lines comes diverse design challenges that we must solve for. Um, and so as a building product manufacturer, you know, each 
aspect of a building where it touches, you have different design challenges. So with wall protection, you know, cleanability is different for wall protection than it is on the exterior of a building. So are the design aspects, aspects and aesthetics. Um, so are the impacts um, resistance of those products. And so Cradle to Cradle allows us, and we're proud um, to have Cradle to Cradle certification on multiple product lines across all different parts of our product portfolio. It really helps us understand and evaluate each of our products as we take them through the design phase. So as um, I want to take you a little bit on construction specialties journey and sustainability. And as Bergen showed earlier on about how material health is the building blocks of being able to get to circular cities. Um, for us, our evolution of sustainability is kind of flips really that diagram on its head. Um, so for us, it was really an evolution of questions that we asked ourselves and our customers started asking us that helped us evolve as an entire organization. So starting at the bottom, um, if you look at in the 90s, most people were talking about the environment from a save the polar bears perspective or don't waste type of conversation. And so really at that point in time, when we really started our sustainability journey, it was really how can we reduce, reuse and recycle um, everything from materials to um, creating a closed loop water treatment facility to reducing the amount of energy we consume. And then the questions that we started asking ourselves really evolved to what effect do we have on our people and what effect does the environment have on people? So again, that kind of that question evolved and um, our role in the market evolved as well and the built environment evolved. You know, LEED and BRIAM was created along with other green building standards to really address those challenges. And for us in the early 2000s, we really saw all of these tiers compress into one when our local community where our primary manufacturing is in Pennsylvania was faced with having a hazardous um, waste incinerator that was going to be built right there in our own backyard. And so a lot of people um, are local for our manufacturing facility. A lot of our own employees were very concerned about what would it do to their health and their property values. And our local community began to protest the building of this facility. Ultimately, the community won, but this intense experience in our local community um, made us ask ourselves, well, you know, obviously there is a need and there is demand for creating this hazardous waste facility. So what is CS contributing to the demand of facilities like this? And that created us to look inside and introspectively and look at what types of materials were we using in our manufacturing processes and products. So in 2002, we really started um, a chemical inventory that grew in sophistication over time. So as we furthered this conversation, we began to realize that products, just like buildings, aren't inanimate objects. Materials are very important. They create enhanced environments through design that can provide healthy interior environments, provide resilience for a building, or create a calming and healing environment. But in order to touch on all those aspects, material health, which is essentially what we're using to design a product, is the foundation. So as many of you know, when you're working on selecting a product for a project, there's a whole slew of criteria that needs to be considered. That exact same, those exact same aspects need to be considered when you're working on designing a product. So for us, we really needed to get a grasp on material health and figure out how to balance it and make progress um, in all of these aspects. So when we first started it out, it was really just a simple chemical inventory program. And we worked with Perkins and Will to help us create an on-product transparency label. This was well before um, health product de declarations were even a thing because we really needed to understand what was going into our products as a starting point. And then ultimately, in order to improve on those, we needed to understand what those chemicals meant. And that's when, um, for good thing, MBDC was created and the cradle to cradle um, standard is really built and flushed out. Because I myself am not a toxicologist or a chemist, and I'm sure many of you on the phone aren't either. I think Bergen's really the only one that might actually have that toxicology uh, credential on the call. But so we really needed to lean on a stronger partner to help us work through this. So we were inspired by Cradle to Cradle remaking the way we make things like many of the other manufacturers on this panel. 
And this book really had a profound statement um, that our society's problems with waste and pollution can really be solved by the very first step of the design process, which is what is your design intent? So anytime we're looking at a product, we really stop to ask ourselves, what is the design intent from all of these aspects? So we adopted the cradle to cradle framework as a guidance principle and an optimization path. Um, and we really leaned on the MBDC consultants to help us understand the toxicology and the chemistry behind our products. So ultimately we could stop doing less bad and working on doing more good. So this optimization process was not easy. We had to go through several iterations of our Acrobin wall protection over a time span of seven years. Um, so if you look at this graph here on the left, um, we started out with our, our standard Acrobin PVC product. And within the cradle to cradle standard, um, PVC is considered a banned substance. And so PVC on this graph is black here, meaning sub, um, symbolizing banned. And then our next evolution was we went to a polycarbonate ADS based blend um, and that symbolized the assessment rating of yellow, which meant it, it's acceptable for use, but it's not really a preferred um, ingredient. And then we optimized once again to our current product line, which is our Acrovin 4000, where you see here we have green, which is meaning the majority of our product here is contains preferable ingredients. And so this really succinctly shows kind of the evolution that we had to go through over time. Um, and as we talked about from all the manufacturers, cradle to cradle is a real holistic standard that helps us optimize all aspects of our products, not just material health. Um, so as we were evolving our product design, we were also being um, encouraged to really look at how are we operating as a company as well. Um, so going back to that Acrovin 3000 product line where we really didn't have any of our um, electricity used for manufacturing produced from non-renewables or from renewables, all of it was from the non-renewable energy source. When we optimized it in for Acrovin 4000, we were able to offset 50% of our electricity to renewable energy. And again, just as of last year, um, we were actually able to offset 100% of all of our electricity to renewable. And so this is an old 70s Acrovin catalog page that we used in an old brochure. And just like design from an aesthetic standpoint has evolved since the 70s, um, so has our product design intent. And product product design has become much more sophisticated as the information to make better material health decisions has become more sophisticated over time as well. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for um, joining me and listening to our journey. And I am excited to uh, go back to our panelists and talk with you more. Great. Thank you all. Um, we are now going to move into our virtual panel discussion, followed by a quick Q&A with the audience. Um, please start thinking about your questions um, and noting them in the questions box in the Zoom platform if you haven't done so already. So while everybody um, kind of turns their cameras back on, I'm going to grab control here. Great. So first of all, thank you, uh, Rachel, Kelly, and Kendra. All of you have outlined the tremendous work you and your organizations are doing to advance healthy spaces in the built environment. I was wondering, how do you prioritize material health when there are so many other aspects to consider within sustainability? Um, Rachel, you wanna start? Yeah, thanks Bergen. So I think material health is what really started everything um, for us. It, and I think because it has really become the building blocks of circularity and sustainability for us. Um, I don't know if people can hear my crying son in the next room, but i um, so sorry about that. Um, but based, it's been the worst timing on this webinar with these lovely things. So basically for us, it started with sick building syndrome and people are aware of their health. People care about their health. And for us, that's really become the foundation. Everything else is built off of that material health foundation, whether it's circularity, good acoustics, biophilia, 
you have to make sure you have that material health component to build off of because if you're using toxic materials, nothing else really matters. Great. Ellie or Kendra, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I actually agree very much that it that it is the foundation. And I did present the multi facets of sustainability and that you do have to try to keep those in balance, but it does very much start with material health first. Um, and there is this growing importance in the market. Um, our customers are asking us for that. And so we have the clear market signal that material health is number one, whether that's in healthcare or office or education or residential sectors, um, whether we call it product human impact, material health is a key piece of that. And where our commercial customers believe we should be focusing, they've, they've given us that feedback in our end market insights reports. Yeah, the only thing that I would add, and I agree with um, the other panelists, is that, you know, material health, it is a building block, just like you'd hear chemistry and chemicals, usually it's advertised as the building blocks of life. Um, material health and chemicals, it's really the building blocks of any products that we make. Um, and we're seeing, and what this understanding our material health journey has allowed us to do is connect closer to our suppliers and our supply chain. And that's actually strengthened us as a business. It allows you to be more resilient because you have more transparency of the supply chain. Um, and just to kind of tie it back to what we're seeing and experiencing right now as a society is the supply chains can be very easily disrupted by things. We're seeing that all the time right now with food and by really understanding your material health and your suppliers and your supply chain, you can connect with that more closely make create a more sustainable and stable supply chain for your products as well. Yeah, fantastic points, Kendra. Um, taking it back to you, Construction Specialties has focused for over a decade on material health as the foundation um, of its product strategy. As sustainable design is, involved, is evolving to include concepts of resiliency, well-being, climate change, and circularity, how do you think found this foundation in material health will prepare CES for the future? Yeah, um, Rachel touched on this a little bit in her presentation about how we really need to almost have like a nutrient label for circularity. And by understanding all of our different components, you can make a more efficient circular supply chain. Um, so by having a better understanding of what goes into our products, we can then find better ways and more efficient ways to reuse them in our products or to create partnerships, um, to be able to have more um, a closed loop program. But really, again, material health enables that foundation to be able to build up the larger systems. Yeah, definitely. Um, and hopefully our, our B4 um, uh, standard will help um, facilitate that process. Great. Rachel, you mentioned your participation in the V4 pilot program in your presentation. I was wondering, um, you know, what you hope to achieve through this process and um, do you have any outcomes that you can share so far? Yeah, so, you know, I talked a lot about material health and also designing for circularity, but I think it's finalizing that loop and ensuring that we have circular systems throughout the organization has been our biggest challenge. And I think Cradle to Cradle version four is really filling some of those gaps um, of the barriers that we've seen to circularity. So um, what Cradle to Cradle version four requires is um, policies from environmental health and safety, from our HR teams and different VPs in different business categories so that people are aware of what circularity is and why we're doing it. We also completed a circularity training with our engineering teams and teaching them about why they've always been designing for uh, circularity and how can we then take it to the next level. Um, uh, V4 is also having us essentially create disassembly instructions that we will send out to building owners so everyone who gets our motorized shade system will also get a set of instructions of what happens at the end of life. So um, V4 is really, you know, shining a light on some of these um, elements that we've needed to work on and incentivizing us through a certification framework to really get it done. Great. Well, I'm curious to hear more <laughs> outcomes of the process. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rachel. 
Um, Kelly, I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, what do you see as post-pandemic trends for 2020 and beyond in, in building products, um, manufacturing, design, and building projects? How do you see your work at Shaw uh, with the Cradle or Cradle certified framework fitting into some of these emerging trends? So we are already seeing uh, an increased focus on cleanability and cleaning solutions for those high and low touch surfaces. That's definitely top of mind. And I believe we will, of course, use design in the future to create social, social distance cues that are a lot more subtle and beautiful than X's on the floor and squares on the floor that I think design can do a better job of, of getting into our psyche and really keeping us um, protected in that way. Touchless technologies will surely be accelerated, um, whether in, in all cases inside the built environment. And then I think product manufacturers are gonna have to potentially re-engineer products uh, to have a little bit more durability to stand up to cleaning frequencies and cleaning chemicals and products that people are gonna use. And even though they're having the best intentions of keeping the environment uh, safe for occupants, I think, um, products maybe aren't today designed for some of the, the chemistries that are going to be used in that way. From a cradle to cradle standpoint, I think uh, cradle to cradle can play a big role for Shaw personally, as we can, we navigate any potential product changes, we will use our, the material health criteria to ensure we don't make any regrettable substitutions. So coming back to that priority on material health, that'll be the first lens and screen that we use to make sure with, that as we react to market requests and market demands for product changes, that we don't make mistakes there and have any regrettable substitutions. Great, thank you. So I think now um, is a good opportunity to open it up to the audience and take a few questions. We have about five minutes left. So let me look here at the Q and A box. Um, looks like one for Rachel. Rachel, do you have a system to promote the reverse logistics of the end of life products to reincorporate components? So I guess this is kind of touching on your V4 pilot and yeah, take back programs that you may so have. That's, that's a great question. So that's one of the things we're trying to figure out with our version four. Um, and it's really making us think. So our, we obviously have, you know, strict locations of where our factories are, right? But we actually have, you know, organizations all over the country that install shades, but they're also able to dismantle shades. So what we're trying to see if there's a way of um, incorporating our local network when it comes to disassembly versus having to ship things all the way across the country. Um, and so that way our dealer network who actually is the ones that installs the shades can use those components again or recycle them based on the quality, however they see fit. So that's, um, haven't really announced that yet to people yet, but that those are some things that we're looking at is, is do we have, does everything have to go to a central location or can we keep it local and keep it in a local, more in a local economy? Interesting, thank you. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more. This is directed at Shaw uh, and you, Kelly. Does Shaw have any thoughts about how to effectively clean carpet in a COVID-19 world? Given that carpet is not a high touch surface, maybe disinfection is not so much of an issue. Any thoughts on this? Absolutely. We have spent quite a lot of time um, working, looking at the, the recommended cleaners that are part of the, the EPA recommended list. Um, and so we do have guidelines that we've published uh, that are for regular cleaning and maintenance, which we've had for a long time, but we also have a new enhanced cleaning protocol that goes a little deeper into, you know, hot water extractions and what temperatures you need to get to. In some cases, you don't need chemicals at all. You just need to get to those elevated temperatures um, that can that can take care of the virus. So something as simple as elevated temperatures of water in hot water extraction. So yeah, we do, we have published those on our brand websites. Those are pretty easy uh, to find and get to. So it's our, our standard maintenance guidelines and then enhanced cleaning recommendations during this time. Great. So I, we've run out of time, but thank you all um, for your thoughtful questions.
um, we will try to pass them along to the panelist and um, you may receive uh, um, you know, an answer from them. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers, Kelly, Kendra, and Rachel, and thank you all for attending. The webinar recording and the slide deck will be sent to you in a follow-up email in the coming days and will also be available on demand on our website. Um, our Making Positive um, webinar series uh, continues on June 4th with Built Environment and Circularity. We hope you can join us then uh, for our uh, then for for that one, and then also our cosmetics and fashion and textiles webinars this summer. Great, thank you, and and take care and stay stay uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.